Loads of you asked whether or not we're going to set up a wildlife camera at the bottom of our garden. That's these things, by the way. It wasn't exactly high on our priority list with everything else that's been going on. And I certainly wasn't planning on making a video about it. But by now you probably know what I'm like for going down rabbit holes, pardon the pun. And boy, did I go down the rabbit hole on this one. There is no way in a million years these pictures were taken with this camera. In fact, that looks strangely familiar. So this is a wildlife camera, often called a trail camera. You put them in your garden or the back of your house and they'll automatically record stuff whenever they detect movement. They're a bit of fun for relatively little money, but they also reveal a darker side of online shopping and how people are getting conned by pictures like this. So later on you'll get to see the surprising array of visitors we get in our suburban garden only two miles from the city of Newcastle-upon-Tyne. But for now we're going to turn our geek level up to 11 and you can follow my demise as I get carried further and further down the rabbit hole of wildlife cameras and the weird economics of mass-produced budget tech. So if you go onto Amazon and search for a wildlife camera, you'll quickly realise that you get presented with a daunting set of results. I mean, you can see here we've got 6,000 results of different cameras here. And the strange thing is, is that they all look almost exactly the same. For example, if you look at these two here, one of them $39.99, the other one $79.99. They've both got a bunch of detectors at the bottom here to trigger the camera. They've got a lens kind of vaguely in the middle and then we've got a cluster of LEDs and they generally emit infrared light to light up the scene at night time. But it's really bizarre, the results just go on and on and on and they all look more or less the same. So I was specifically in the market for a 4K wildlife camera in the hope that it would give us better quality footage. And this is really where things started going horribly downhill. I actually bought this one here, decent reviews, but honestly to say I was disappointed is an understatement and this led us to go down this whole rabbit hole of working out where these cameras were actually built, what components were used, what on earth is going on with the different file formats. So we're going to look at three different cameras here. We've got a Keyjector or Kajector camera that was $69.99 and I've actually already returned that. We've then got this Vicary camera at $50.99 and then we've got the cheapest one I could find with vaguely reasonable reviews and this is the Seomua, we'll call it Seomua at $35.99. So I'm going to start off with the Vicary one. And then on the box itself, we have got model A1 and it's made by Shenzhen Angshin Kang Technology Company Limited. So it's a Vicary A1 and you would think that would be mentioned somewhere on the main product description in Amazon. It's this camera at the top here. I mean when you scroll down we've got You So Good, Cool Life, Medes, Guard Pro, Seamur, but there's no mention of the make or model anywhere on this. It's not until you delve into the technical details that you can see that it's a Vicary A1. Apparently it's 1520p video resolution, although it doesn't, all oh right, it says on the back here. So a lot of this you can take with a pinch of salt, but the main thing's 20 megapixel, 1520p video, so we'll whip this out the box. Let's see what we actually get with the Vicary. So we've got the little instruction manual. So there's the camera itself. By the looks of it, I think this takes eight AA batteries. Although I have heard various rumors that it works with only four batteries, but I might be completely wrong about that. We'll come back to that when we actually test it. And on the back, it's pretty much the same information that's on the box. So that's all fine. Yeah, okay. So this is a thing where I've seen this on some reviews where they only give you four batteries, but clearly there's a compartment that takes up to eight batteries. So doubtless we'll learn a bit more about that later on. We've also got like the mounting thing and a strap for attaching it onto a tree. And we've got a pointless USB cable as well, which I'll probably never ever use. 
So as I say, that is the Vicary. Next up is the Seymour 35.99. As I say, cheapest one I could find. It says, yeah, Seymour CY50. In terms of what it says on the box, this is clearly a time-lapse camera, two inch LCD. They all seem to be the same in terms of two inch LCD, IP66 waterproof. Let's open it up, see what we'll get in this one. So we've got instructions, camera with all the bits on, and then we've got accessory wise, let's have a look. We've got, let's see, it's all identical. Rip that, never mind. Look at that, the wall plugs are even the same. <laughs> so we've got the mount thing. As I say, the pointless wall plugs, pointless USB cable, and a strap for attaching it onto a tree. And just a sanity check, there's the horrible Phillips screws and wall plugs that came with the Seymour camera and there's the horrible Phillips screws and wall plugs that came with the Vicary camera. So as I say, Seymour is the cheapest one I'd find. $35.99, almost half the price of the Keyjector one that I returned. As I say, we'll come back to that later. The only things you really need to know about the Seymour one is, again, it's 20 megapixel, allegedly, but this one's only 1080p video as opposed to 1520p which is what the uh, Vicary one has. And the key ejector allegedly was 4K, so kind of 2160p. But in my experience, that was just nonsense. So we'll have a quick look. And so this one doesn't come with any batteries, so they've obviously saved a bit of money. And where do you put the batteries on this? Ah, ah. Battery's got, but... ah, okay. So it's got a nifty little battery holder thing that goes up its backside. So it still takes eight double A's. Pop that back in. So it's that little push button there to release the battery compartment. Other than that, all looks pretty much the same. Very similar. So there's everything that came with the cheaper Seymour camera and there's everything that came with the Vicary. As I say, the main difference is that the Vicary obviously comes with four batteries as opposed to eight. We'll find out why later on. But other than that, my word, it's very, very similar. Just to clarify the battery situation as well. So this is the Vicary, the more expensive one that says, this camera uses four or eight 1.5 volt alkaline batteries. Please place them all in the upper or lower part of the battery box. So, <laughs> if you just put four batteries in or eight, I have no idea. I can only assume it'll just, the batteries will last longer. I would assume they're wired in parallel, but I'm not entirely sure. And then likewise, let's have a look at what the Seymour one says. So interestingly, it is actually slightly different wording, which is a good sign. So it's not a literal copy and paste between two different manufacturers. But this one says requires four or eight alkaline or lithium batteries. But again, well, this one actually says six volts, two amps, as opposed to one and a half amps. But I suspect it's the same thing where it's effectively two banks of six volts wired in parallel, I guess. So I'll quickly show you the menu system on both of them and then we'll take them outside and we'll take a few test shots to see what the actual difference is. The way these work is that they've got a test mode, really test is kind of your setup mode, and then you've got on, which is the position that you would switch it on when you're ready to actually take some real footage. But for the purpose of setting it up, we'll put it into the test mode, which is the middle position. And then we'll go into the menu on both of them and I'll just show you the way that I've set things up. And again, you can see that the menus are 
a little bit different to each other. Don't get me wrong, they're all more or less the same, but the Seymour does look a little bit different to the majority of the ones I've seen on the market, to be honest. So first of all, mode, I'm gonna have it in video only mode. Ignore photo resolution, I'm not taking any photos. Video resolution, I'm gonna have in 1080p. Video length, I'm setting to 60 seconds. So that's once it's been triggered, it'll keep recording for 60 seconds and then stop until it gets triggered again. PIR sensitivity on both of them, I've got them set to medium. Again, all of these I'm just leaving on the default settings, not doing time lapse. I've already set the date format to UK style. I've set the date and time. The Seymour actually has a temperature unit option, which is quite nice. So I've got that set to Celsius for the UK. I've switched the beep sound off because it's unbelievably annoying. Audio recording I've switched on. This one has the option of time stamping it with the date, time and logo, which I'll leave it like that for now so that we can differentiate between the two nice and easily. But normally I would probably switch the logo option off. And then password protection, we're not bothering with that. I've formatted the memory card. I've only got a four gig memory card in this, so I'm gonna be a little bit limited on the recording length, but it'll be okay. And that is pretty much it. So we'll just go back to the default screen there. I'll change the mode. So you can see, I can only take 11 minutes and 54 seconds of footage on the Seymour one. But one other thing I forgot to mention is that the Vickery came with a memory card. I think it's a 32 gig memory card it comes with. So again, mode, I've got that set to video mode. Photo resolution, don't care. I'm not taking photos. Uh, photo series, don't care. Video resolution. I've got that again set on 1080. I'm not gonna try it on the weird 1520 thing yet. But interestingly, note that it says 1520 at 20 frames per second. So it'd be interesting to see what frames per second we'll get at 1080. I would assume it's higher than that. Time-lapse video resolution, we're not doing a time-lapse. And video length, again, we've got it set on one minute from being triggered. Audio recording is on. Shot lag, not bothering with that. Beep sound I've switched off. And as I say, this came with a little micro SD card. As I say, I think 32 gig. Serial number reset settings. So yeah, that's basically it for the menu system on the Vickery one. So that is ready to rock. So first thing I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna set them up. Bit of a daytime shot. I'll set them up under here, pointing kind of in that direction and we'll just see what their daytime video quality is like. They'll probably pick up the cats more than they do any birds, but you should get the general idea. So when you switch it on, it normally does like a 15 second countdown. So I'm just gonna set that up kind of there. So the Seymour only has a five second countdown, but it doesn't really matter. We'll put them next to each other. Uh, we'll pop some seed down. Right, see what happens. So somewhat predictably, Nugget is the first one to trigger the cameras. Now do bear in mind there was very bright sunshine at the time this was filmed, so don't be too harsh on the budget Seymour camera. Even my more expensive cameras would have struggled in this lighting. However, you can see the sunny part of the frame is completely overexposed, and there's very little detail in the darks. It does have a weird frame rate of 18.15 frames per second, but this wasn't as noticeable as I thought it would be. And also listen to the audio quality and compare it to the superior bikery. So here's the same shot from the Vickery, noticeably better quality, and once the cat is out the frame, it's done a decent job of getting a more balanced exposure. Coupled with a more sensible frame rate and much better audio quality, the Vickery wins hands down. On a side-by-side -side comparison, the Seymour took five seconds longer to trigger for some reason, by which time Nugget was almost completely out of the frame. And then just to give a direct comparison between the darker parts of the shot, 
you can clearly see not only much more detail from the bikery, but it's also a much wider angle shot as well. There were two other shots where the same mower completely failed to trigger. One was from where I was scattering the bird seed. And one where chicken made a brief appearance, but the same mower just didn't pick it up at all. Here's some footage from the Kajekta camera that I returned. Bit of an unfair comparison since it wasn't sunny, so there were much less contrast issues. Generally though, the footage doesn't seem to be as sharp as a bikery. And check out what happens to the frame rate when I switch to 4K. That's right folks, even though this is advertised as a 4K camera, it drops the frame rate right down to just 10 frames per second, which looks ridiculous. Interestingly, also check out the information at the bottom of the screen. It's identical to the cheaper Vikery camera. And by the way, you can take the temperature readings with a pinch of salt. These seem to be wildly out on all of them. And by the way, just for completeness, I went back and quickly redid this test when the sunshine wasn't quite as glaring. So here's the Seymour camera. And here's exactly the same time of day filmed with the bikery camera. I'll show you what the nighttime footage looks like very shortly, but I wanted to just go into a little bit of nerdy, geeky kind of talking about file formats and stuff like that. Because annoyingly, all three of these cameras record in AVI format. Now, if all you want to do is take some footage and watch it for, you know, whatever, put it on a memory stick or something like that, AVI format probably isn't going to bother you that much. But my big gripe with AVI files is that DaVinci Resolve just doesn't support them. And it's kind of weird because DaVinci seems to treat them in a few different ways. For example, this is some of the Vikery files here. And if I try and drag and drop these into DaVinci, just nothing happens. Literally, the files just don't appear to go anywhere. But strangely enough, for whatever reason, the Seomore files do work, kind of. Again, they're in AVI format, but if I drag those into here, now you get all sorts of weird vagaries going on, like they're showing us media offline at the top, but as soon as you hover over them, they work. And I can drag and drop those into the timeline absolutely fine as AVI files. So essentially the Kjekta files won't import into DaVinci Resolve at all. Neither will the Vikery files, but the Seomua ones do. But they're all in AVI format. Yes, the uh, bitrate's different between them, but you can see the codec ID is Motion JPEG, Motion JPEG, Motion JPEG, color space, YUV, everything is identical. The only thing I can find for the footage that doesn't work, the scan type is showing as progressive, whereas on the same more camera, it's not showing as any scan type. Other than that, everything looks exactly the same to me. And on top of all that, all of them work in Vegas editing software absolutely fine, but I don't use Vegas anymore, so I'm not gonna use Vegas for video editing just for footage that happens to have used these cameras. As I say, it's a little bit of a weird one. It's not the end of the world, and I'll show you a workaround in a minute, but if you wanna drill into that in a bit more detail, you can see all of the tech information there. If you do know the reason for these two not working in DaVinci, and this one does work in DaVinci, then post it down in the comments below. Anyway, I did say there was a workaround. I'll just delete these out of here because although they do work, I don't like the way sometimes they show up in the video editor as media offline and things. It's very strange. So I'm gonna remove these. And then I'm just using this tool called Shutter Encoder. So literally all you do is you just take the AVI files drag and drop them into Shutter Encoder. And you're not doing a full re-encode on the files, that takes forever. All we're gonna do is a rewrap. So rewrap, and I'm just gonna put them as MOV files. Click go. And that's it done. But for example, if you pick an output encoder of like H.265, and we'll change it to MP4 on those, I'll start it, you'll see. It takes quite a long time. So if you're doing that across a lot of footage, 
it's just not really practical and I'm struggling to find any benefit for it anyway. So as I say, I'll just do the rewrap. Here's the MOVs, literally just had a rewrap, drag and drop, straight in, absolutely no problem. Right, nighttime shots. So I'm just gonna set this up kind of here and I'm doing it on a tripod because, well, I'll tell you why in a minute, but that should be all right there. But let me just show you this quickly because it's worth pointing out. So this is a Vickery that I'm gonna try first of all, and this is a CMO1. And they've both got tripod connectors on the bottom. And that is probably your easiest way of setting things up. I'll tell you why in a minute, but one thing to note here is that the Vickery the tripod connector is really thin plastic at the bottom there, whereas the CMO one actually has quite a beefy section of plastic on it. So yeah, I guarantee if anything's gonna break on this Vickery, it is gonna be this tripod connector, but yeah, such is life. Of course, the other option is that you use a mounting plate and the way this works is you basically, uh, this attaches on to here this little bolt and then you screw this on a, like a tree or something like that but in my experience of trying these things they are absolutely useless a complete waste of time once you've got a camera that has eight AA batteries in this just can't take the weight of it and in my experience it'll just slowly start to kind of sag and you'll lose all of your shot framing that you had. There's really nothing to stop this from spinning around. I mean, it would have been nice to have some sort of locking washer or like a notch in this so that it couldn't just rotate of its own accord. But again, as I say, imagine you've got this set up, bearing in mind the tripod connectors on the bottom, then once you've got that set up, what's gonna happen to it? Well, it's either gonna do that and flop down and then even if you mega tighten these bolts, then this bit will probably end up flopping down over the course of a night and you'll completely lose your shot. Another way that I've tried it is to try using the camera upside down and that does actually work better. So you do it that way around and you kind of hang the camera from this, but then you've got to do loads of stuff in post-production because all of the time and date information is then upside down. So you end up having to strip that off the bottom of the footage, rotate everything 180 degrees, and then stick it back on again. The crux of it is, this is a waste of time. Probably the better option is to use a strap and just strap it to a tree or anything that's nearby. But obviously then you've got pretty much zero control over the angle that it's pointed at, and obviously you need an appropriately sized tree as well, which in our situation, there's lots of trees, but none that would give me a shot pointing in the direction that I wanted to be pointing. So as I say, for our situation, tripod is working out best, but I would suggest for most people, probably this strap thing and strap it onto a post or something like that. Let's quickly talk about connectivity and getting your footage off the camera after you've actually filmed something. And as I've mentioned before, both cameras come with little USB cables. The CMO comes with an ancient mini USB cable. I haven't seen one of those since the PlayStation 3. And the Vickery comes with a micro USB cable. I will almost guarantee you will never use these, so you might as well just put them back in the box. And the reason for that is transferring footage off the camera via the cable is staggeringly slow. So you might as well just plug the memory card directly into your computer. For the Vickery camera, transferring a single file containing one minute of HD footage took five seconds via direct transfer, but six times longer via the micro USB cable and the Seymour took nine seconds to transfer a single video file directly versus a whopping four minutes and 50 seconds via the ancient mini USB cable. So yeah, using the cable took 32 times longer. This actually revealed another interesting thing about the Vickery in that the free 32 gig memory card is actually quite fast. Often these freebie ultra cheap memory cards can be painfully slow. But this one's actually faster than my SanDisk Extreme card that I use for the GoPro. And it's significantly faster than the 4 gig SD card that I had knocking about that I've used in the Seymour camera. Do you need a mounting bracket? No, it's rubbish. Just put it on a tripod or strap it to a tree. 
Do you need the cables that came with it? No, they're pointless. And should I replace the supplied memory card with a branded one? Well, no, in my experience, the supplied one's actually quite fast. So here's some footage from the original Kajekta camera that I returned. That noise you hear is an owl getting perturbed about a fox. As you can see, I filmed this upside down and was too lazy to rotate the text. Generally it worked pretty well and had a decently long trigger distance, but the picture quality is pretty poor considering this was the most expensive camera of the three. But not only did we get loads of footage of the neighbourhood fox, but there was also a badger and we were very lucky to have the owl land in shot, even if it was hidden by some grass. Four o'clock in the morning and we have the dawn chorus captured thanks to a blackbird triggering the camera. So here's the sea moor and its biggest problem is late triggering. There were several shots of nothing since whatever had appeared in the frame had gone by the time the camera burst into life. We did eventually pick up Nugget on his nightly patrols, closely followed by another cat blatantly ignoring Nugget's claim of territory. And then finally we've got the Vigary. It was initially triggered by fresh air with no visible wildlife in the shot, although it's vaguely possible that something was hidden in the grass. Later on though, we got a great shot of a badger and to me, the quality looks way better than the other cameras. And it looks like the fox is a regular early morning visitor. All in all, the Vigary seems to perform the best, but there's really not a lot in it. I felt like there was more to learn. So I took them to bits. So this is the Vigary's little LED module, infrared LEDs. Presumably these are just normal LEDs here as some sort of indicator. And then this is your collection of no glow infrared LEDs to illuminate everything at night. Needless to say, I've looked up all these numbers, but this looks like a manufacturing date. 25th of October, 2019, maybe? Nothing to suggest where this was made or who by. Anyway, we'll pop that back. The Seymour camera, my word, how many fixings to hold the, uh, that's just to hold the back cover on and to hold this little circuit board in. So again, here's the bank of IR LEDs at the back here. Again, this has a manufacturing date on it, 24th of the 10th, 2020. And then presumably under here, we've got the little CMOS sensor and the camera. Again, I've looked everything up all the part numbers that are on here, I can't find anything. Obviously this connects into the battery compartment at the top, so don't really need to worry about that. But over on this side, we've got the little screen and then underneath that, very carefully, we've got microphone down the bottom there. There's our little on off switch. Not entirely sure what this red and black cable's doing here. Oh, one will be for this. One's a little speaker, one's a little microphone. I think that's the mic and I think that's the little speaker because obviously it beeps. There's our rubbish little USB mini connector there. Our main kind of movement detector up the top here. And the interesting thing is this chip here. So this chip, the only thing I can find out about it, it's an SPCA, I think it's a 1625A. I struggled to find that exact part number, but this one's close enough. And what it says here, it's a highly integrated solution for digital still cameras. It consists of image processing, image compression, storage interface controller, TV encoder. It's got all sorts built into this chip. Mechanical shutter and flashlight control support, color correction, bad pixel correction. Yeah, this literally controls everything. Manufactured by Sun Plus Technology Company Limited, for what it's worth. No information on here about how much these cost, but these will sell for pennies. You would buy them, you know, a hundred thousand at a time or whatever. 
To answer the question about whether or not you need four or eight batteries, well, we can kind of confirm our suspicions here that we've got two banks of six volts. So six volts here and six volts here. And then when that plugs in, the positive on this side makes contact with this wire here. The positive on this side makes contact with this wire here. And then we're using a shared negative contact in the middle here. So basically under here, there's a plate that joins up across here that makes contact with both of these. And that means you're gonna have six volts coming in between here and here, and six volts coming in between here and here, as I say, with a shared negative. Unfortunately, it's almost impossible to see what the tracks on the board are doing past that point. I suspect they're running through these here, but I mean, this could be a multi-layer board. It's really hard to say what's going on. I can't see any tracks on here, so I don't know if there's any intelligence built in to either use this side or this side, or obviously both, and what the implications of that are. The Vicary actually handles it slightly differently. I'll show you that in a minute. Looking at the Vicary insides in a bit more detail, as I say, here's the infrared LED block. This is actually the microphone connection on the front and then the speaker because the speaker is on the other side of this. Obviously this normally sits there like that. So there's a speaker there. So the speaker is somewhere on the other side of here, basically. We've got the PIR movement detector here. So obviously when there's movement past the camera, this is what picks it up. So there'll always have to be power going to this. And then when it picks up movement, it triggers the whole thing to spring into life. If it's nighttime, it'll switch on the no glow LEDs. Obviously the camera will kick into life and everything is controlled via this one chip here, which I'll tell you about in a second. But I did promise I'd answer a couple of questions about the batteries on this one. Do you need four or eight batteries? Well, here is the battery connector coming in, this wire here, because obviously on this camera, the way it's designed is that it's got this hinge assembly. So it's getting its power from here but all the governs are on this side. So it needs to take the power out of this side somehow. So it takes it through this tiny little hinge here. So all of this has to be manually put together and silicon put in here to stop water getting in. And then our six volts, I presume, we'll check in a minute, are coming in through these two connectors. There is only two physical connections here, unlike the CMO, which has three. So it can address the two banks of the battery separately. Now, there's not a lot to give away in here how this is wired, but if I take the batteries out, which I probably should have done from the start, I think we're gonna to have to have a look under this panel here. And really, we're none the wiser. We've got obviously six volts in this bank here, six volts in this bank here, but unless I desolder all of this, I can't get this little circuit board out to see what's going on on the other side of it. It looks like, well, I don't know. This is a negative here, but we've got a wire going to it. Oh, hold on, that's not a wire. What is that? Yeah, that's just the input for connecting a power supply up to it, which obviously comes in under the board there. But there might be components on the other side of this little board. All I can see is that we've got negative coming in here, positive here, and then obviously negative here. It looks like we're using the same negative kind of back plane, if you like, or bus bar. And then we've got positive coming to here. So I have no idea whether there's some intelligence built in on the other side of this board or whether there's simply a connector from that positive to that positive. Either way, it's only two wires coming out of this. And I suspect it makes no difference what side you put the four batteries into. You're just gonna get longer life if you use eight batteries, I think. And that is confirmed on both cameras. If I put four batteries into one of the banks, it worked fine. If I put four batteries into the other bank, it worked fine. And if I put eight batteries in, it worked fine as well. So I think we're relatively safe to say the eight battery thing is just for a longer lifespan. Anyway, let me just turn this the other way around. The brains of this operation is this JL3365B chip here. So I did a bit of a search for the JL3365 chipset and really struggled to find anything other than the fact 
that it's used in a lot of different cameras. So for example, if we go on to this website here on Alibaba, we've got a random trail camera. Now these are obviously designed to be bought in bulk, $28.50 if you buy more than a thousand of them. But yeah, if we scroll down on here, it says chipset JL3365. Now, obviously most of this is in Chinese, but we do have HD King keeps coming up. Just out of a matter of interest, what happens if we search for that on Amazon? HD King. Nothing. Okay. I suspect there's some sort of OEM and then it'll get rebranded, I guess. So I did find a website for HD King. Shenzhen HD King Electronics Company Limited owns a big factory, has 450 employees. Products, what do they make? Oh my word, they make literally everything. Action cameras, wildlife cameras, baby monitors, dash cams. Holy moly, if it's got a camera in it, this company probably makes it. Here's a company information video. Oh my word, look at this. They've got all the gear. Look at all the wildlife cameras. There's one being put together. I did obviously look on the Vikery website, but doesn't really tell you very much more. I don't know if it's Vikery who actually made the camera. I very much doubt it is. But they've actually only got two products listed on their website. So this is the one I've got here, the 1520p. I wonder where they're located. According to the box, the Vikery is the Shenzhen Action Kang Technology Company Limited. And it's on Zulongchen Road in Shenzhen. Huh? <gasps> here it is. Well, there's Sulongchen Road. Of course, in China, the maps never match up to where everything is. So this little junction here, that squirrely bit, is actually this little bit here. So everything's kind of diagonally offset to the right and down a little bit. So that must be, it must be around here somewhere. Could be one of these new bits. It says it's in Yezhenshin Science and Technology Park, but, hmm. Could be something getting constructed. But yeah, there's Shenzhen, and there's Dongguan, near Hong Kong. What about HD King? Where are they located? Oh look, they've got a map. Uh, doesn't really help that much. Well, it's a 35 minute drive away. It's not exactly far. But at the same time, they're not exactly neighbours, are they? So, hmm. Whoa, look at all the trains. Jeez, what's that? Is that a go-kart track? Whoa, they're big boats. Uh, that is quite a lot of containers. There's more over here. That's mad. That's a mad roof. Whoa, that's a lot of solar panels. What on earth? Look at all the tower cranes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12. I need to stop. And why do they all insist on putting like information in square brackets at the beginning of the descriptions? It's just really weird. See what else it says. Look at this. Oh, <laughs> that reminds me actually. The photos that they use on this, how they get away with that. Let me just show you on Amazon. So here's the Siamua uh, camera. As I say, it's $35.99, but let's just look through this quickly. It's the same on all of them, but look at this. There is no way in a million years these pictures were taken with this camera. In fact, that looks strangely familiar. Uh, okay. So yeah, if that's the quality you're expecting from your wildlife camera, well, yeah, that's just a stock photo from Unsplash. Thank you, Martin Sepian, for taking that beautiful photo with a Nikon D3500. This will be a laugh. Here's the Seomuir website. <laughs> this is the camera I've got. Once again, do you think that's the kind of footage you're going to get? Shout when you see it, folks. I 
that's it, isn't it? There we go, looks familiar. Thank you very much, Diana Parkhouse, for that one. What else have we got? This is always fun. Google reverse image search is your friend for this sort of thing. How about this? Delivering crisp photo and video. We've got some flamingos. There it is, Shutterstock. There it is. Who took that one? Alexander Chaikin. Thank you for your beautiful photos of flamingos. But the crux of it is, is that I will almost guarantee none of the photos shown on the marketing materials will have been taken by the trail cameras themselves. 0.2 second trigger time. There is no way in a million years that a 35 quid trail camera is going to take a photo of a cheetah like that. So I guess since this is kind of a review, I should actually tell you what I think of all of these. The Kajekta is okay, but expensive compared to the other two. It only films at 10 frames per second in 4K mode, and their marketing spiel is probably the most outrageous of all of them. There is no way on earth a time-lapse on this camera will look anything like this, so it's kind of disqualified. The CMOA, I like the forward-facing screen. I like the modular battery compartment. Thank you for using proper buttons. And the tripod mount is vaguely decent. The mini USB thing is a bit pointless and the quality of the footage isn't quite as good, but for 35 quid, seriously, how's that even possible? If you're on a budget and you just want to give wildlife cameras a try, honestly, this is a great starting point. The Vicary comes with batteries that I haven't even unwrapped and it comes with a memory card, so that's probably worth about a tenner. I don't like the awful membrane switches and the tripod mount will probably break, but the picture quality is pretty good. It also has no glow LEDs, but I've heard mixed reports as to whether that's a good or bad thing. All of the cameras use AVI format, which is a bit rubbish, but easily fixed and all of them could benefit from better quality audio. But there's a darker side to what's going on here and I can't really delve into it in this video, but whether you're buying a combi drill or a wildlife camera, you need to be aware of it. There are clearly shenanigans afoot here and it needs to be talked about. The UK has historically had some of the best consumer protection laws in the world. We've got the ASA to protect against false advertising. We've got the Citizens Advice Bureau and trading standards to hopefully protect against dodgy products. But we've got to be realistic here. No organisation in the world has the resources to look into 9,000 different variants of wildlife cameras. Especially since, in reality, if there was a problem, you would just get a refund anyway. But this does have a serious side to it. We've already talked about my daughter's bed. We bought it online, it broke in half. If someone had been sitting underneath it at the time, they would have been seriously injured. And with these wildlife cameras, honestly, it's such blatant false advertising. I don't know how they're getting away with it. Almost every wildlife camera on Amazon is showing footage that wasn't taken by that camera. They're stock photos taken by professional photographers using really expensive gear. And coupled with that, check out what's going on with the reviews. I'm singling out the Vicary here, but it's the same on all of them. Look at this. The reviews now make sense. Yesterday I received a letter from the seller offering to pay me £30 for a five-star review and a further £5 for a video or photo. Here's another interesting one. I purchased the B1, sold starting in October 21, which should not be confused with the A1, which is the one that I've got, sold starting in 2020. The B1 does not come with batteries or memory card, but is the B1 a better camera? I've no idea. Either way, it's not working properly. Here's another one. Thank you for choosing Vicary. I'm an after-sales worker at Vicary. I've noticed that you've written a negative review. Are you still interested in our product or can you accept $80 as compensation and delete the negative review? For the Seomua, trigger speed not as advertised. Well, we had the exact problem. Broke after less than two months. Lasted a month. Wouldn't format any memory card. Sent it back. Poor quality. So it does make me slightly suspicious about the Kajekta camera getting 4.8 on average when 4K footage is only at 10 frames per second. And on top of all that, I'm now hearing of creators having their Amazon accounts shut down if they question the goings on in the company. It's all getting very sinister. So, you know, buyer beware, I guess. But let's put this into perspective. 
This is the little camera I use for recording my YouTube stuff. I'm using it right now. It's a Sony ZV-1 and it cost me around £700. My next upgrade after this would probably be closer to £2,000. Meanwhile, they're knocking these little things out for 50 quid each. And when you deduct sales taxes, Amazon's own fees, credit card processing fees, shipping charges, affiliate partner fees, storage fees, and the profit made by each link in the chain, to produce gadgets like this that cram so much into a single little box and does so many different functions they must be producing it in insane volumes and that means there will be literally millions of these sitting in boxes in massive warehouses all gradually becoming more and more obsolete that's the world we live in now like it or not so the moral of this story i probably shouldn't be promoting companies that are rife with false advertising and blatant corruption. I have no idea what the employees were paid for building these things. I mean, they look happy enough on the video, but I imagine it's quite far removed from the UK national minimum wage. And let's be honest about this, no matter how many icons they put on the box, these, along with all the other junk that we buy, are ultimately going to end up in landfill. But on the flip side, life is short and you can get quite a lot of fun out of these for 50 quid. I'll probably get a couple of years use out of them, which pound for pound is way better than my mobile phone. And it's not like these things are getting built to order. These already exist in gargantuan quantities. Whether you buy one or not, they're either going to go from a warehouse to landfill or from you to landfill after you've had a couple of years use out of it. So I hate to say it, but you're not saving the planet by not buying one. And you know, if you're lucky, you might see a fox or a badger wandering around your garden, clearly not being stressed by the moral quandary of capitalism. So, you know, I'm kind of stuck on the side of history where life without capitalism would mean certain death. But hopefully you've learned something, or at least been vaguely entertained while having your lunch. Let me know if you've managed to get a perfect freeze frame of a cheetah with your wildlife camera. For now, folks, as per usual, look after each other, be nice to each other, and we shall see you next time. Tatty bye.